Hello fellow Aegis Rimmers! This is a spoiler free review of the game 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim. I have thoroughly enjoyed this game as it fills a series of niches I think crosses over with people who like Megaton. So I talked about Aegis Rim previously, shortly before the Western release. I'd recommend you watch that video now if you just want more development type stuff. Now I've played it and I gotta say, it's truly a remarkable game. Aegis Rim is a story about kids being thrust into an unusual scenario. They are dreaming unusual dreams of robots and aliens. Some lack memory of who they are. Some crave a grand adventure. And some are just dealing with typical teenager things. I'm not gonna spoil the plot because again, I want you to play the game. But I do want to talk about the game. The game balances the reveal of information, the pacing, and the character personalities quite well. The cast is varied enough so that people are distinct and although they follow many traditional tropes, they're still quite engaging. The idea of kids being thrust into a bizarre situation isn't exactly new, neither is kids and mechs. But I swear to you, the way this game broaches both tired concepts is actually interesting. And I will say that I have high regard for the style of storytelling that they utilize. What I mean is that they go for an episodic storytelling approach. For the most part, each character has their own independent story arc with spillover to the other stories. Or sometimes they'll explain the same situation but from their perspective. It's quite enjoyable because each storyline is unique and we aren't watching all 13 figures repeating the same bits of information 13 times. Instead, we see each person understanding the story as it relates to them. This results in a storytelling style where we aren't receiving the same pieces of information over and over, which can be a problem in video games. One of the best aspects is how information is paced. One thing I kind of don't like in storytelling with video games is when characters all around the protagonist or the playable cast kind of repeat information over and over so then it'll be one character discovering a piece of information and then several different characters either questioning or repeating that piece of information if only to confirm it so then the audience clearly understands what's going on in the scenario. This game doesn't do that. What the game does do though is tell a story full of interesting layers. They pull back each layer slowly and it's interesting because it just manages to delicately balance the intrigue of this mystery while introducing new mysteries after solving that mystery. Because characters are intertwined, your choice of story and who to play kind of matters. Though keep in mind you will be juggling many different narratives. This can be overwhelming at times though the choices do feel like choices. This isn't to say that the story isn't without its flaws, as some characters are clearly more integral than others, both to the overarching narrative or just in regards to having an interesting and engaging story or a set of action. There are two protagonists in particular who I felt were much more simplistic in the style of game that this is, one of which was relegated to a comedic relief character with some story, and the other being an exposition dump who kind of explained everything the very end of the game. And since the other 11 characters have such strong narratives, these two felt weaker by proxy. To add to this, the comic relief wasn't really for me. I found the character pretty annoying as it took away from the hard boiled and intelligent sci-fi narrative. Now the initial couple of hours of the game is quite amazing. They balance both the introduction of all of the cast as well as the introductory to the battle system in a way that's very balanced as you're jumping back and forth and you kind of become acclimated to both things very quickly. But after this kind of opens up to your player experience, it kind of becomes more disconnected in a way because now you're not relying on what the game is telling you to do structure wise, you're dictating it yourself and there's not a whole lot of incentive tying both gameplay styles together. And while both gameplay styles are very engaging, they don't feel connected. Throughout the game, there's locks and progression either behind encouraging the player to interact with other characters or because they want you to continue the battle system. As I said previously, this could be improved to then have better balance between the two modes. To talk about the adventure system a little bit more, the game has an interesting recollection system where words and phrases will trigger more dialogue, though it's not always clear what you have to do next. For me, this aspect of the game was a means to an end. I did find it enjoyable due to the excellent line delivery from both the English and Japanese cast. At times, the words you cycle through really does become cumbersome, with some words staying in the thought cloud far beyond necessary. It felt somewhat like a cheap way to extend the gameplay, cycling through the thought cloud. The game has a solid use of localization, though some things I took issue with were very, very small, like the cat being renamed to Fluffy in the Western version instead of Shippo. Shippo means tail in Japanese, and it's just a cute cat name. 
Fluffy being a name for American short hair, a breed not typically known for being fluffy, is very unusual in my opinion. My personal experience also being painted by the fact that I would alternate between the Japanese and English voice acting, so hearing Megumi call him Shippo while reading Fluffy was just kind of confusing. One of the other positives about the game is the way it looks. You can stop what you're doing and just enjoy the ambiance created. It has this pseudo dimensionality created by the layering process I mentioned in the other Aegis Rim video. So in short, it's pretty darn pretty. The only downside is that at times this could be immersion breaking, whether it's a discomfort in navigating the pseudo dimensional planes or moving your character up and down. There was seldom a moment where I felt lost though. I often started each chapter testing what I could do, especially in the prologues as even with the walking and running animations, you get a good feel for what the character's personality is like. Now I want to talk about something that isn't the visual novel slash adventure story aspect. The other major function is the battle system. This battle system, put simply, is a real-time strategy tower defense hybrid. In this system, there's four types of sentinels. The melee, the all-arounders, the range, and the support. While running a wave or a mission, you have to consider what enemy types will be present, as well as what mission restrictions you will be engaging in if you want those bonuses. Yes, you should do all the bonuses. These considerations often force you to try everyone, which is a great way to understand what style you prefer to play. And it guides you into understanding the basic strategies that you should employ. As you use characters, they level up and gain skills. These are unlocked at five level intervals from level five to 30. And these really open up tactics depending on what you prefer and the pairings of the characters themselves as they have specific pairing preference. Shu, for instance, gets really strong if Yuki is in the party once he hits level 25, but alternatively before that, he gets a general buff when you have any female characters in his party at all at level 10. This additional wrinkle in the system is interesting though some of these skills are too situational in my opinion. For example, if Natsuno is attacked while you have a level 30 plus Yuki, Yuki gets a huge attack boost. But that probably won't ever trigger because Natsuno is a long range attack sentinel, thus she never gets hit. I can almost guarantee none of my long range units ever got hit in my 50 hours of gameplay. This part of the game is my favorite part. Although I hungrily devour the story, I love this RTS tower hybrid, despite the fact that I'm bad at RTS and tower defense. Along with the pilot skills, you can buy skills and weapons to use for your sentinels. Each sort of sentinel has specific weapons that they're able to use, and you can also upgrade the meta system itself. I would highly recommend you do the meta system as soon as you can, because that boost in meta chips, the currency that's used for upgrades, is invaluable so the sooner you have it the better off you are. Another thing you can do is you can boost the different stats of the various pilots. While that last thing sounds enticing, I think this leads into my biggest criticism of the game. The normal mode of the destruction mode of the game is very, very easy. A trophy unlocks when you hit S rank 30 times which means you basically got to do that every mission in the game. It's just super easy to do. I found intense to be more of a fair representation of what a normal difficulty should be like. I understand this element of the game is probably what most people dreaded or disliked when compared to the visual novel slash adventure elements, but really it is competently designed. There's a real care to the mode, but it just lacks some quality of life touches. Maybe some cut-ins for attacks or maybe better banter throughout the whole gameplay. Maybe more connectivity to the visual novel part of the game. As I said earlier, the earlier portion of the game balances this mode with the other mode quite well. After the game opened up, I essentially kept that balance up myself, keeping the percentages for completion about the same for this mode and the adventure mode as well as for each of the different units. Earlier I mentioned that you can level up pilot stats. So I said it's useless because I never did it. Not until I beat the game, wherein you unlock a new gauntlet to attack, area four. So I was really intrigued by this additional sector as I wanted to see what kind of bonuses you would unlock by beating it. Were you gonna get more dialogue and story? Were you gonna get cool, fun bonuses to make the game even more fun to play or replay? Well, after about 30 levels into sector four, I decided to Google it and I found out that this game has 9,999 waves in Sector 4. And someone was crazy enough to go through the whole thing, and it took them about 400 hours. So there's no benefit for beating this. No story, no Easter eggs, nothing is behind it. I was really disappointed by that revelation, so I kind of just dropped it. The difficulty in this mode just really hurt it for me as well. 
I typically got an A through S rank each time, first try. And because I maxed out everything, I eventually was able to just focus on maxing out pilot stats. It got to a point where certain pilots were just ridiculously strong. All of that criticism being said, I really do hope that the next Vanillaware game approaches a real-time strategy slash tower defense style again, but in more depth because the bones in this game are quite competent bones. Lots of calcium. I want to briefly mention the music. I liked it. Overall, this game is my favorite game of this year, and I hope this review gets you to pick up a copy. If you like this video, go ahead and subscribe and leave a like or whatever you want to do. If you need some incentive, just know that Ogata is my favorite character, and that character I kept saying I hated is Hijiyama. Yakisoba Pan, guys! Goodbye, fellow Aegis Rimmers.